can you have an awesome marriage and family in a day and age when families all over the world are falling apart? Today, we want to discover God's key to an awesome family. You know, all of us say, well, I want to come from a good family. I want there to be in my family that I grew up in. I wanted there to be love, and I wanted there to be joy, and I wanted there to be peace. And I wanted my mom and dad to love each other, and I wanted them to love me. And so we want to come from a good family, and we want to experience that for ourselves when we get married, if and when we get married, if and when we have children. But here's the truth of the matter. The sad reality is... So many people don't have a good marriage and they don't have a good family. And divorce is rampant and homes that uh, are supposed to be home sweet home, so much of the time they're filled with arguments and tension and and bitterness and discord. And uh, kids grow up in a home like that and they think, man, I know one thing, I don't want to have a home like I came from. Some are saying, I've seen disaster in, in my parents' marriage and in, in divorce and all that, I, maybe I don't want to get married at all. Well, that's sad because God has created marriage and family to be wonderful. On a scale of 1 to 10, God wants you to have a 12 for your marriage and for your family. And for many of us, we don't really know how that comes about. You know, we, we go into marriage thinking, well, this is going to be great, and she's going to meet my needs, and he's going to meet my needs. And, and uh, you know, if you go in thinking the other person's going to make you happy, you're in trouble. Somebody just described marriage this way. It's two ticks and no dog. Uh, that you're, in, you're in trouble when there are two ticks and no dog. But, you know, marriage is you're giving. You're not uh, just taking from the other person. But you, you say, well, how, what is the key? Maybe there's a key to this thing called a successful uh, family, having an awesome marriage and family. Maybe there's a key. Ogden Nash, the poet, he offered this key. He said, to keep your marriage brimming with love in the loving cup, when you're wrong, admit it, and when you're right, shut up. And uh, that, that's pretty good advice, but that's not the key. God gives us the key. God, the one who created marriage and family, he gives us the key as to what is it going to take to have an awesome marriage and family, one that's filled with love and joy and peace and satisfaction. And as we look at Psalm 127, we see that the key is not hidden under a stone. It's hanging on the front door. Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. What is the key? The key is Jesus. The key is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the key. But now that's a very broad uh, answer to the question And you say, well, how do I get my hands around that? Well, we're going to look at Psalm 127 and break it down and see what uh, the the key, the Lord, what he wants from us and what he says, if you will do this, then this will happen. There are three requirements in order to experience an awesome marriage and family. Requirement number one, the Lord must be the builder of your home. It must be the builder. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Now, the Lord loves to build things. It wasn't just by coincidence that Jesus was born into a home where Joseph was a carpenter and Jesus became a carpenter. Before he started his ministry, he was a carpenter in Nazareth. And as a carpenter, he built lots of things. The Lord loves to build. Uh, The Bible says about Jesus, Jesus said of himself, told the disciples, uh, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
for I go to prepare a place for you. I'm building you a heavenly place. And I'm going to come back and get you one day so that where I am there you may be also. The Lord is building us a heavenly home. The Lord is building a church home because he said to Peter and the disciples, upon this rock, speaking of himself, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So he builds a heavenly home, he builds a church home, but he also wants to build your family home. How do you get God to build your house? You make the decision to serve him with all your heart. See, the Lord wants you to fully submit to him. Not partially, not mostly. He wants you to fully commit to him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, to love him and to commit yourself to him. He's worthy of that. Now, it is uh, such a slam, such an insult to the Lord that we would say, well, Lord, I believe in you, and I want the blessings that you give, but I don't want to follow you with all my heart. I mean, I want to do some other things, Lord. I don't, I don't want to become fanatical about you. I, I would just like to give you a little bit of my heart and then go do some other things and, and have some other loves and some other interests and, and Lord, just kind of uh, have you when I need you. You know, like God's some kind of lucky rabbit's foot. You know, when you're in trouble, then you grab onto the Lord. But when you're not, you just kind of leave him in the dust. Jesus said to that church in Ephesus, you do a lot of good things, but I have this against you, that you've left your first love. I'm not number one in your heart anymore. And a person who makes the Lord the builder of his marriage and his family, well, that's a person that's fully submitted to the Lord. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, speaking of Jesus, he is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. Now, question, does the Lord have first place in everything in your life? First place in your job? First place in your marriage? First place in your family? First place in your finances? First place in your free time? Is he really number one? For most of us, it's hard to answer that question and say, yes, God is deserving of all your life. He wants you to fully submit to him. That's how he becomes the builder, when you fully submit to him. And he wants you to not only fully submit to him, but genuinely walk with him. John said this in 1 John chapter 1. This is the message that we announced to you from the beginning that we announced to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light... As he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What is the Christian life? It is a walk by faith in the light with the Lord Jesus Christ. You walk in the light, which means you bring your sins into the light. We don't like to do that. We kind of like to hide them in the darkness. You have to bring them to the light and confess those to the Lord and deal with those things so that you can walk with him. If you don't, then the Bible says you're, you're just uh, saying you have fellowship with him. You don't really have fellowship with him. You're the $3 worth of God person. You just want a little bit of God, just kind of sprinkle a little bit of God over the top of my marriage, over the top of my family, and then I want to have an awesome family. It doesn't work that way. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And then it says in verse 2, it is vain for you to rise up early to retire late to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Hey, we, as we walk with God, we trust him day by day. We trust him to provide for us. That doesn't mean we sit around doing a bunch of nothing. We work, but we don't work ourselves to death. Uh, we, are, we are human beings, not human doings. And some people, they, they get, I mean, once they get married, then uh, the husband is like, okay, uh, honey, you take care of the kids, and I'm just going to go work and work and work and work, and I'm going to earn us a big living, and, and, you know, they don't work eight hours a day, they don't work 10 hours a day, it's 12 hours a day, it's 14 hours a day, I got to make my way in this world, I got to provide for my family, and I'm all for that. But listen, if the uh, practice of your life is for you to work 12 hours, 14 hours a day. There are only so many hours in the day. 
and you're going to burn yourself out. And you're going to, if you're spending all your time at work, you're not spending your time with your spouse and with your children. And the Lord says, don't do that. It's vain to do that. You might amass a lot of money, but you're going to lose in the long run. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. God gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Hey, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. The Lord must be the builder of your home. That's the first requirement. Second requirement, the Lord must be the protector of your home. Look at verse 1 again. Unless the Lord guards the city... The watchman keeps awake in vain. Now, why do I need the Lord, and why do you need the Lord to guard your house? It's because you have an enemy prowling around the perimeter. That's why. You have an enemy, I have an enemy, and that enemy is the devil. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The devil is outside in the, on the perimeter. He's outside the wall. And if you don't have the Lord guarding the house, the devil is looking to see who can I take out, who can I devour. And the devil is too strong for you or for me. We can't stand against the devil in and of ourselves. We need the Lord to be able to stand against the devil. And unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. Let me tell you something about the devil. He has a plan. He comes to steal and kill and destroy. That's what he, he's the original terminator. He's not going to stop. He doesn't ever take a break. He is going to try and destroy you, and he wants to hit you where it hurts the most, and where it hurts the most is at home. If he can hurt you in the business world, hey, you know what? You can get another job. But if he hits you at home and hurts your marriage and hurts your family, you're in serious, serious trouble. Let me tell you something else that can destroy your marriage and family. Oh, got some messages. Uh, <laughs> is your smartphone. This is an iPhone. And we, th these things are invaluable to us. I mean, we just went on a trip and everyone had a phone. Uh, you, you know, you have it to stay connected, and these are good things, but these can be devastating things because of the things that you can pull up on these phones, because of the way that you can uh, flirt on these phones. You think it's minor. You think it's no big deal. It's a big deal. My friend Greg Mott, who's pastor at First Baptist in Houston, he said in his family they have a no-phone zone in his home. He said when we have dinner at the dinner table, no phone, the phones go in the no-phone zone. He said, we don't let our kids take their phone back into their bedroom at night. Why? Because it's too much temptation. And so at night when the kids go to bed, the phone goes in the no phone zone. And uh, you, you, it's going to be confiscated until the morning. we got to watch ourselves, uh, men and women, because if we don't, the devil will come in and steal and kill and destroy so we need the Lord to guard the house. We need the Lord to guard the house because the enemy is prowling around the perimeter, but also because you have an enemy prowling on the inside. The devil's on the outside, but there's an enemy on the inside, and that enemy on the inside is called your flesh. Paul said, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Your flesh wants to sin. I've been crucified with Christ, and there's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. And your flesh has been crucified with Christ, but your flesh still has a voice, and your flesh still calls out. You don't have to obey the flesh. I don't have to obey the flesh as a Christian, but you hear the flesh, and there's the pull of the flesh, and the flesh wants to lust, and the flesh wants to be greedy, and the flesh wants to get revenge, and the, the flesh wants to to uh, be jealous, and all those things. And the Bible says the only way you defeat the flesh is in the power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire, the desire of the flesh. 
For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. There's a battle that rages inside of every Christian. It's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. And the spirit wants to obey God, and the flesh wants to listen to the voice of the devil, the voice of the tempter, and the flesh wants to uh, lust and wants to commit sin and wants to gratify the flesh and wants to overeat and overindulge and all those things. He wants to be lazy, wants to be uh, hateful. That's the flesh. And you can't control the flesh with the flesh. You can only control the flesh with the spirit. Hey, we need the Lord to guard the house, to guard the marriage, to guard the home and guard the family. So the Lord must be the builder of your home. The Lord must be the protector of your home. And then thirdly, the Lord must be the multiplier of the home. The multiplier of the home. Verse 3, behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. The Lord is the multiplier of the home. You remember what the Lord said to Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That was the command to Adam and Eve. Now, God loves children. And God likes us to be fruitful and to multiply. Now, that comes from God. He's the one who opens the womb. I don't care how good medical science gets. God is the one who gives life. And he's the one that opens the womb. And sometimes God doesn't open the womb. And we probably have some people in this room today who want to have a child and can't have a child and they don't understand. I don't understand about why God doesn't give children to some who desperately want children, and I don't understand why God gives lots of children to those who are throwing them away. But I know that you can trust God. I know that God is good. I know that God's ways are not our ways. But here's the thing that we read from Scripture, and we can say in general from Scripture, the Lord wants his children to have children. He wants that. Children are a gift of the Lord, the fruit of the womb is a reward. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, he told Adam and Eve. And God wants his children to have children. It says in Malachi chapter 2, verse 15, didn't God make you one body and spirit with her? He's talking about the husband to his wife. What was his purpose in this, making you one spirit with her? It was that you should have children who are truly God's people. God wants Christians to have children. And we need to have as many children as we can have under the uh, direction of God. We need not say, as this one lady told me just recently, she said, well, I wouldn't want to have kids. She said, because this world is too evil, and so I wouldn't want to bring kids up in this world. Well, God wants you to have kids. God wants his children to have children because God wants his children to teach the the children how to know him, how to love him, how to come into a relationship with him, how to be the people he wants them to be. So not only does the Lord want his children to have children, the Lord wants his children to raise godly children. See, he says it was that you should have children who are truly God's people. As parents... God wants us to be serious about what he wants us to do with the kids he's given us, and that is to raise godly children. The focus is to raise godly kids, to train them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, to train them in the way that they should go so that when they're old, they don't depart from it. The focus of parenting is not to see if you can get your kid to be valedictorian. Focus of parenting is not to see if you can get your kid on this select uh, soccer team or volleyball team or baseball team and uh, maybe hopefully get a scholarship or be the star of the team. That's not the focus of parenting. Those things are well and fine, but it seems in our world today that has become the focus, especially with sports. I love sports, but sports is out of control. 
Sports is a major, major idol in America and in so many Christian homes. That has replaced the Lord as number one. You say, well, I don't think that's true. That dictates everything. It dictates everything. I mean, oh, we, we can't come to church on Wednesday night because we have ball game. We can't come to church on Sunday because we, you know, my son is in select and he, we go away every weekend. And as one couple told me, so this was years ago, they said, well, my son got picked to be on this hockey team. And so we're going to be out uh, for the next six months of Sundays. I said, well, how does that work with your spiritual life? Well, I, I don't know how it's going to work with our spiritual life, but, but this is hockey. Like, who cares if it's hockey? You say, well, he's not going to ever get that, that big break to play in the pros unless he does good in select. It's vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. He gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Put God first. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Listen, the goal is to raise godly children and we've gotten that off. And then we wonder why when our kids get older and, you know, sure as the world, they didn't make it to the pros because very few do. And so we emphasize, oh, sports, 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 sports. And then they get older and you know what? They don't want to have much to do with God. Why? Because we tacitly taught them as parents that God is not as important as baseball, as hockey, as football, as volleyball. What's up with that? Hey, the goal of a parent before God is to raise godly children. And if your kids are out of church and you are out of church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, listen, church is not the be-all, end-all, but it's really important. And growing Christians come to church to worship. And the Bible clearly says in the book of Hebrews, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near, the day of Christ's return. We need to come together Sunday after Sunday to encourage one another, to grow together, to hear the word, to praise the Lord. That helps your heart to stay on fire. And we want to raise our kids in the fear and the admonition and the instruction of the Lord and let them know that being with God's people on Sunday, that is critical to us because that's how you grow. That's how you grow. Listen, spending time together as a family, having dinner together as a family, those are important things. The no phone zone, that's an, an important thing. Dealing with issues, bedtime, where you can, especially with little kids, dads, let me encourage you, you be the one to put your kids to bed. You be the one to share Bible stories and pray with your children at night. That makes a difference in their lives. The Lord is the multiplier of the home. Now, just in closing, you know, you look at Psalm 127 and you say, okay, well, that's, that's God's blueprint for the home. And you say, well, I don't really want to do it that way. That's fine. You don't have to do it that way. But what does he say? Unless I build the house, all your labor is going to be in vain. Unless I guard the house, all the labor is going to be in vain. Unless you do it my way, you're not going to experience the blessings that come from my hand. See, we have a choice. We have a choice in life. We can do life our way, what sounds good to us, or we can do it his way. The Bible says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end are the ways of death. Let me encourage you with all my heart, in your life, in your home, in your marriage, in your family, do it God's way. And when you do it God's way, you experience the blessings from God. Children are like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. An arrow was once a crooked stick, and somebody took that crooked stick, and somebody began to work on that stick, and sharp that, sharpened that stick, and shaped that stick, and polished that stick, and sanded that stick, and put that stick in the bow, and shot that arrow at the enemy, and that's what God wants parents to do with their children, to raise up godly children who will be arrows to be shot against the enemy of our souls to make a difference for Jesus Christ in this world. That's the responsibility of mom and dad. We can go God's way and be blessed. We can go our way and experience uselessness and ruin and vanity. 
The choice is yours. The choice is clear. Go God's way and be blessed. Let's face it, parenting is tough. Navigating the obstacles we face as parents in this day and age of smartphones, social media, and the sexual revolution is daunting to say the least. Now without question, God's design for the family is under serious attack. And the big question is this, how can you have a great marriage and family and raise good and godly children? I believe my seven message series titled, We Are Family, can help you do just that. You see, it's time for Christians to stand up and fight for their families. And that starts with you. I hope you'll get your copy of the We Are Family series, a series full of practical and timely truth so you can honor God and experience His peace, love, and joy in your home. God bless you. The seven message series, We Are Family, is available on CDs, DVDs, a USB flash drive, or digital download with your gift to From His Heart this month of any amount. And with that gift, we'll also send you Pastor Jeff's timely booklet, I Still Do. To get yours, go online to fromhisheart.org or call 877-777-6171. We believe this study will provide timely and practical truth for your family. Get We Are Family today. Thanks so much for watching. As we get ready to close out today, I want to ask you, do you know for certain that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? If not, today is the day for you. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my heart to change me. I surrender my all to you. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. Hey, I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching and to know that God is using this program to make a difference in your life. Please contact us with the information on your screen. And remember this, you're important to God and you're important to us. And we're here for you.